want to dedicate this talk today to my mom. Her name's Shirley Hesterberg, because most of my story today is actually my mom's story. She was a major influence on my faith journey, but there were some big bumps along the way. I talked with my mom at length about this to make sure I got all the facts straight. And my 82-year-old mother's memory, it's true, is better than my own. So rest assured, there will be no fake news here today. <laughs> I grew up in a small farm town named Waterloo, Illinois. Not to be confused with Waterloo, Iowa, which is a giant metropolis compared to my hometown. My town is in southern Illinois, about 30 miles southeast of St. Louis. You cross the Mississippi, you drive through some cornfields and past rock quarries, and voila, there's Waterloo where everybody knows your name. So small, we only had one flashing four-way stoplight in the entire town. In Waterloo, there are four seasons, planting, harvesting, hunting, and baseball. Go Cardinals! <laughs> Many city folk would see Waterloo as a picture-perfect small town. There's a lovely brick courthouse in the middle of the town square, which is on Main Street, of course, and lining Main Street are these charming, well-preserved, historic buildings. There's even a bandstand on the town square, and people go there on summer nights to listen to the Warley German band play oompa music. Warley was, and still is, a proud German town. There are dozens of Hestebergs in Warley, but it's hard to find us almost anywhere else except in Germany. The problem was, there was zero diversity in Waterloo. All my friends were white, there was not one single African-American or Latino who lived in my town. It was big news when an Asian family moved to town, and I was in college before I knew anyone Jewish. Warley was incredibly conservative. People were wary of who and what they knew nothing about, and most Waterlooans didn't really know anyone of another sexual orientation, race, or a non-Christian religion. So there were three churches in town. We had Lutheran, Catholic, and St. Paul United Church of Christ. That was my church. The entire town went to church every Sunday. Going to Sunday school was as routine as going to school school. There was no sports on Sunday mornings. To this day, my mom's horrified when I tell her about all the sports we have to go to for my sons. This is gonna make us miss church. Case in point, my son is sitting here in his Cardinals uniform, running off to a Little League game right after church. So mom and dad were also born and raised in Waterloo. They grew up on farms. My dad's family always went to church, but my mom's parents did not belong to a church, which was really actually very unusual. In eighth grade, my mom was invited to join the confirmation class at the St. Paul Church. And so she went, not because she had some big religious epiphany, but because she said, it's where I knew all my friends would be. And so she was confirmed, and that was the beginning of her lifelong commitment to that church. My parents' church resume is extremely impressive. Over the years, I'm going to try to get through this fast, they were youth fellowship leaders, ushers, stewards, consistory leaders, and elders. They counted the offering every week. They helped with caring ministries. They went to weekly Bible study. My mom was the parish nurse. My dad was chairman of the Building and Grounds Committee for years. And they both served as the vice president and the president of the church. And my mom actually did that two times. Their devotion to the church was without a doubt. Our church had a beloved pastor for 27 years. To me and many others, he was St. Paul UCC. To this day, I still compare all their church services to his. Don't worry, Reverend Pettis, you're doing pretty good. But in the late 90s, our dear pastor retired. And so this church that had experienced virtually no change for 27 years began the search for a new leader. Eventually, the church called Pastor Steve he was not from our neck of the woods, and my mom was now the vice president. She got to know him really well, and she greatly respected him. They saw eye to eye on almost everything. Mom describes him as funny, thoughtful, and open-minded. So shortly after Pastor Steve came to Waterloo, the UCC General Synod put forth a resolution to be an open and affirming church. Today, we're all familiar with this phrase, right? ONA, but not so much in 1999 and definitely not in my provincial little town. Sadly, this well-intentioned resolution caused two long years of turmoil and controversy in our church. Many long-standing members of the congregation demanded that our church leave the UCC because they wanted nothing to do with an open and affirming movement. It did not matter to these people that the UCC could never force ONA on our church. You probably know every local church in the UCC 
is autonomous and can choose whether or not to adopt any general synod resolution. But that didn't matter. They still wanted to abandon the UCC. As luck would have it, my mom was now the church president when all this started. So most of you would probably consider my mom to be left-leaning by LA standards, but in Waterloo, she's like a raging liberal. <laughs> and so she actually supported this idea of open and affirming. And mom has told me, though, that ONA didn't really influence her. She felt like instead it was finally catching up with how she had always felt. And she describes it as, my unchurched parents had always taught her to love and accept others, even if they were different, even if people, she didn't understand everyone's beliefs. But more than anything, my mom wanted her beloved church to remain intact and in the UCC. Eventually, my mom and the pastor brokered a deal with the conservatives, as we called them in our house, to save the church. Um, this had nothing really to do with the ONA. That was so far-reaching that they wouldn't even consider it. And so the deal went like this, and honestly, it's really embarrassing for me to stand here in front of you today and read this. So in the year 2001, not 1951, uh, my church voted to remain in the UCC, but abide by the following three policies. To never call a gay minister, to never recommend a gay member of the church for ordination, and to never perform a same-gender marriage in the sanctuary. The vote passed, and then 50% of the congregation still left the church. 50%. The church split in half, all because these people were so narrow-minded and fearful and upset with the UCC. And even worse, many blamed my mother, because she was the president, the leader. They accused her of being a puppet of that liberal new pastor. Mom and dad lost lifelong friends. They refused to speak to my mom or look her in the eye. These were people my parents had known since grade school. Friends they went out with every weekend, and even their best friends who they vacationed with every year. The whole ordeal shattered my mom. It crushed her spirit, and she lost the confidence that she'd always had. She lost weight. She cried often. Honestly, she needed therapy, but you didn't do that in Waterloo, Illinois. So thank God for my dad. He was her rock. But my mom has never been quite the same, and much of the damage to the friendships was permanent. Some of these people have taken the grudge to their grave. But mom is also a strong woman. She's still here, and time has largely healed much of her pain. But today I look back, and I'm amazed at the courage, the strength, and the resolve she had. Two weeks ago, I listened to Rabbi Kalev stand right here and talk about having the courage to be yourself. My mom did that. She never questioned her faith or her own beliefs. She stood up for what she believed was right in her heart. She did everything she could to keep her church together. As the wise Albus Dumbledore says in Harry Potter, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. So St. Paul UCC survived, but it's never been the same either. Pastor Steve left in less than two years. The church needed to heal, and he knew it couldn't do that with him there. People in town were hurtful to him, his wife, and even his children at school. And not to mention, this was not exactly the job he'd signed up for. Since then, the church has been through four senior pastors, five associate pastors, and eight interim pastors. In 2012, they finally had a vote again to overturn those three policies because they could not find any UCC minister who was willing to work under such xenophobic restrictions. All this happened when I was about 30 years old. I was here in LA working hard and playing hard. It was easy for my brothers and me to dismiss the turmoil back home because we weren't living it. But every phone call with mom would turn into this agonizing commentary on the church crisis. We couldn't understand how she'd let it become so all-consuming. Just walk away from it, we'd say. But of course, mom never considered that for a moment. My brother was so disgusted by it all that he said, I'm out, done with organized religion. And he rarely stepped foot in a church since then. Throughout college in my 20s, I sporadically went to church, but never put much effort into really finding a church family here in LA. And then this ordeal happened, and I also lost all interest in a church and was not happy with the UCC. Then this ordeal, um, sorry, a few years later, my husband Chris and I had our first son, Aiden, 
And something tugged deep inside me, saying, give it another chance. Kids should understand Christianity and the lessons of the Bible. Chris and I are not overly religious people, but we do believe in Christian values of unity and equality. So we were lucky to live next to Guy and Judy Hatley. I know they're here somewhere. And they said, do you know there's this wonderful UCC church, like two blocks from our house? You can, you can walk to church in the morning. And so the rest is history. We visited and we became members of this fine church, and we've been here since 2006. The extreme contrast of St. Paul UCC and Manhattan Beach Community Church has always made me so appreciate what we have here. This church community genuinely opens our hearts and welcomes everyone. It's not just a statement on our website. It's not a verse we recite without thought. We embrace inclusion. A couple years ago, our Vacation Bible School celebrated all world religions. This past year, our confirmation class, you'll hear from them next week, right, visited a Jewish synagogue, a Buddhist temple, and a Catholic church. And it's not just our children who are learning. The adult discussion group has invited speakers to talk about a wide range of places, cultures, and religions like Syria, Muslims and Islam, Mormon, Arabs, Judaism, and Buddhism. Recently, there was an open discussion with our LGBT members to really, truly hear their thoughts and get their input. And I'm thrilled that we have a good relationship and a pulpit exchange with the Jewish synagogue CTJ. I want my boys to make their own religious choices down the road, like my mom did and as she allowed me to do. My boys can only do that if they have an understanding and an appreciation of other people, cultures, and religions. After all, Jesus prayed that they may all be one, not that they all be the same. In preparing for today, I came across the following words on ucc.org. It says, our faith is 2,000 years old. Our thinking is not. I'm so relieved to be part of a church that recognizes and accepts today's world. So thank you, Manhattan Beach Community Church, for giving me renewed faith in the United Church of Christ. I feel blessed to be part of this community. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Um, I too worked on preparing um, my statement here this morning and it's been a long and arduous uh, journey. Uh, my wife has had to put up with the last couple days of my whining and complaining about what am I going to say and are they going to be receptive? And uh, then I talked to Candy Duncan this morning and a number of the uh, choir members and they said just look up at us and talk to the choir. Preach to the choir. <laughs> My opportunity. <laughs> now they've been, um, and before I, the music starts and I'm um, taken off um, <laughs> in limited time, I do want to thank the choir. I want to thank Pat. I want to thank Lee. Uh, being part of the choir has been a fantastic thing. Uh, I was here at the church for 14 years. I've been at the church almost 14 years. You know, the first 10 years I sat in the back row. I think Amanda's back there. Is Amanda back there in the back row? Oh, you're over there. I thought you were going to be back row. Anyway, uh, Therese and I sat in the back row and we really enjoyed the church. We uh, got to know people and um, it's been a great experience. So enough said about that. My path of faith began at Lenox Methodist Church. And Lenox is a small little burg between Hawthorne and Inglewood, just down the street. Um, my grandparents were very devout Methodists. My mom sang in the choir. What a surprise, right? And um, as, as a Methodist, when I began when I was in fifth as a kindergartner and went all the way through high school. And one of the things about the Methodist church, and it was a really, really good foundation for Christianity, but the kids were separated from the adults. We had Sunday school. We sanctuary very, as a child and sitting in the first three rows because they always blocked it off for us. And we'd sit there, and the minister, uh, Reverend Moore, wonderful man, really, really wonderful man, but he didn't like kids in church too much <laughs> because they squirmed and drew pictures and, you know, all of that. So uh, I remember going to church and sitting in the first couple rows and the minister looking down at us the whole time. And it was kind of intimidating, and needless to say, um, I like being over in Sunday school. 
What I did, what I did come to uh, my faith conclusion, or what it's ever evolving, and Mark's got a lot of work for him still, is <laughs> that um, I really feel that we are all just God's people. Uh, I was talking to Ray Lambert on Thursday at uh, choir practice, and Ray said, well, what's your message? I go, what message? I thought we we're just supposed to talk about us and our journey. So for Ray, um, my message is we are all just God's people. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what continent you live on. We're God's people. So in, in um, being raised a Methodist in high school, um, in drama, my junior and senior year, our drama director and his wife were very, very devout, devout Mormons. And they invited me to be in a musical. Uh, they had musical productions from the local wards, which is the lo local churches. And we would go to the stake center and perform. Well, I didn't know anything about being a Mormon. And when he said we'd go to the stake center, I'm like, okay, steak, like steak, dinner theater, all right. No, seriously, I thought Stake Center. Yeah. <laughs> but what it was is the Stake Center and the Mormon uh, faith is the regional, and so the local wards come to the stake. So I was a little bit disappointed, but we performed well. <laughs> we um, didn't win. There were, there were like 25 wards. So it was 25 little 10-minute musicals. Really, really neat thing. And I kind of toyed with becoming a Mormon, but it just didn't really fit for me. I mean, every, you've got to find your own path. Then, of course, I go off to a Catholic university, Loyola, small Catholic university in Westchester, down the street. And it was there that I auditioned for the men's choir under Paul Salomonovich. And I, I auditioned with singing Happy Birthday and My Country Tis of Thee, because I didn't know any of the classics. And I was very, very fortunate that he accepted me into the choir, and I sang there for four years during college. I also went back, and when I went to law school, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> when I went to law school, I came back and I was invited to sing, so even lawyers get to sing on occasion. <laughs> and while, we, while I was there, I took uh, religious classes. You had to take two classes, and one of them was religions of the world. So I was exposed to a lot more in different religions, with all the different rituals, with all the different traditions. And I thought at that time, gosh, you know, if you were born in a different part of the world, and if you're a different religion, does that exclude you from what we know as heaven or God's place? Because you're not a specific sect, you're not a specific religion. And I think that personally, that's where some of our religions kind of fall apart from the standpoint that nothing is exclusive. I mean, being born in India or being born in Iraq shouldn't exclude you from God's world. And we're just all God's people. I thought about becoming Catholic. I looked at it. I had a lot of Catholic friends. I've got a Catholic priest, a friend of mine, that goes to the horse races. And I'm a big horse race guy. So whenever I'd go to the races with him, I always thought we'd get some divine intervention. <laughs> nope. Actually, he's a really good handicapper, though. <laughs> but in any event, after that, I went to law school, and I didn't attend church for many, many years. In fact, the first church that I started coming uh, to after uh, graduating from law school at age 25 was MBCC. And uh, during those years from 25 to joining MBCC, uh, I call them my heathen years. And it's not that I'm a heathen. It wasn't that I was doing bad things. It was that I found out from friends later that we were heathens. And what I mean by that is, is that I played golf, I water skied, I played volleyball. And what I found out here at MBCC is you can go skiing for Jesus. <laughs> you know, who knew? So I think I thought at that time I was playing golf for Jesus and water skiing for Jesus, volleyball for Jesus. I'm being, um, I don't mean to make light of it, but I thought, I thought it's a neat thing, skiing for Jesus, because, because you don't have to be in a structure and you don't have to have somebody standing up in front of you to think about what's good in life and what God means to you. Um, I have a tournament, uh, a Kernville tournament, and that's up in Lake Isabella. 
I've had the tournament for about 25 years. It's an annual tournament. I started it uh, 25 years ago to have friends come up from the city, like Lenox and Inglewood, and, and come up uh, to Lake Isabella. It's a neat area. It's a lot of fun up there. And the Kernville tournament, you play with a partner. It's a two-man scramble, so you play with another guy. And it's a two-day tournament. Well, on the second day in 1992, my partner and I, uh, Lee, can you hold that for a minute? Thank you. <laughs> um, my partner and I, we were winning, we were winning the tournament. We had uh, three holes to go out of 41. We had played 41, so we had three holes to go. And um, we both hit the ball, and we think they went out of bounds because it went around the corner and brush. And we were winning, and it was like really a shame because we had wanted to win the tournament. So I, I proclaimed that if the balls were in bounds, I would go to church. I hadn't been to church in a long time, but I promised I'd go to church. So what happened is we rolled down the fairway, came up, we found the balls. And I started jumping around, I'm going to church, I'm going to church. <laughs> My friends on the golf course looked over and thought, yeah, that's Tony, whatever, you know, <laughs> usual. And um, we ended up winning. The hole, it's the 15th hole on the Kernville course, is known affectionately by my friends as the church hole. <laughs> so we had a little bit of influence that way, right? And, and um, we ended up winning the tournament, so it was a lot of fun. Um, in that tournament, I had a friend, and his name's Joe. I'll just call him Joe, it's just for lack of a name. Okay, well, I've, Lee, I just need a, like a minute or two more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lee, I get the message. But seriously, um, I had, a, I had a friend that played in the golf tournament for a couple of years, and uh, he had moved from Illinois, and he was, uh, I guess, a member of a church in Illinois, and his dad was a minister, and I guess it was very, very strict, very religious, very exclusive, very tight. But Joe, I'm just calling him Joe, uh, was a real good friend, and he went back and he was going to get married. And when he in, at his wedding, his dad, a minister, was preaching about how Joe had left the pack, had left his people, had um, gone out to California where the heathens are. So that's when I realized I was a heathen. And my friend said, heathens? He wasn't with heathens. He was with us. Exactly. In any event, I do want to thank um, MBCC. I want to thank um, my wife, Teresa. My daughter Madison uh, works with Wally with the youth here. She really enjoys it. It's a really great experience. We wouldn't be here but for Nancy Klazowski, our neighbor, when uh, Madison was five years old. And Teresa and I knew that we needed to find a church to um, develop Christian, Christian foundation for Madison. Uh, Nancy asked her to be an angel. And we were really joy, overjoyed with that. And we were lucky that that year MBCC didn't have enough angels, right? <laughs> so we, we started coming here and then got to know Rick Hefner. And if I was going to do a service, a, a sermon about um, selflessness, that would be Rick Hefner. And um, I mean, he's the best guy I know in terms of he'll do anything for anybody, anytime. And one of the neat things that he did for me is he invited me to come out and sing at the choir after 10 years of sitting in the back row because we had sang karaoke together, and he thought, wow, that guy can carry a note. <laughs> That's a true story. I do want to thank um, Mark and, and, um, for giving me this opportunity, and the church for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm still working on my uh, foundation, my faith formation. It's always changing. It's always growing. I honestly do believe, though, that we are all God's people. And I'd also like to say that I think that MBCC is a really, really lovely place to walk your path, to find. I'm very comfortable in the 10th row, in the last row, or up there. Here, not so much. But, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a wonderful place to be, and I think that everybody feels comfortable. I think that NBC is an opportunity for anyone from wherever you came, from whatever your past was, for where you are now, and where we're going to be. And I think that we need to consider that in making choices and decisions in the future, whichever way they go because we're all just God's people. Thank you.